what do you think the incentive is for Google to have <laughs> scientists that are not skeptics at all? So they have the 26 committee that handles all the articles on climate <coughs> change and they refuse to let any skeptics in that group. So when you Google, you're gonna get anti-climate change, I mean pro the pro-climate change information. What is the incentive, do you think, for them to do that? <laughs> Who's the question to? Well, I don't know who anybody who knows the answer. I don't. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'd, I'd like to ask one, one more question of you, perhaps to answer this. How many of you think this has ever been about science? Are the same guys that did uh, that 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 came out with the next forecast, and it's always the same guys. They are not scientists. They are scientific administrators, and they go with the money. Eisenhower. Everybody remembers Eisenhower's a farewell speech where he said, "Beware of the uh, military-industrial complex." What they don't remember is that four paragraphs on, he said, beware of the scientific technological elite because they are no longer individual scientists. They are scientists being run by universities, and that makes a hell of a lot of difference. Beware of the scientific industrial elite. Look it up. If I might just make one, one more brief comment. Writing for Forbes was, I, I used to get a fair amount of respect in my life when I was doing space stuff. And, and it wasn't until I started writing about climate stuff and politically incorrect stuff for Forbes that I, I realized that uh, I was living, living in a very sheltered world. I would write an article and, and almost immediately within 20 minutes I started getting ad hominem attacks and, and, uh, and, and the thing was they were orchestrated. And I got to know who they were and so on. And, and it was a highly organized activity. And uh, basically, they would cut and paste some kind of generic things that they would say, or they would attack me because I'm not a climate scientist, nor have I ever presented myself as one. And so it's, we're up against a very organized activity. And, and unfortunately, on our side, we're not organized. You know, we, 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 tend, to, we tend to naively believe it's about science. And we, we argue the science. We try to argue the merits. We don't realize they don't play fair because that's not their agenda. Their agenda is an agenda. And, uh, and they're very determined about it. Could I say a few words on this? I'm a bit worried about this. I'm often accused of it, conspiracy theory uh, building up. Uh, agenda is not considered a positive word, but it could also be visions. It could be a better world. I'm just saying, I, I'll be very careful. There are some bad people and they would just use it like a go to make money out of it. But for my own children, for my students, there's some very idealistic people too who really think the world is very unfair. There's a lot of injustice in the world and they have seen this, this climate threat as a means. They weren't, don't forget, particularly the United States, not only the United States, have killed a lot of enthusiasm in young people when they weren't allowed to be human, humanists anymore. They weren't allowed to worry about inequality. They all immediately become communists or socialists and it's all the same thing. At the end of the Cold War is related to the rise amongst the young of uh, environmentalism. I'm not in favor of it and I totally agree with, with the chap who left Greenpeace, what he said on this. On the other hand, I myself went through this phase. A lot of my students are dedicated, good, decent environmentalists who want to do good, and to put them all into the conspiracy, wanting to do us all down, it won't help us to win allies in winning this fight. There's a book called The, um, the Politics of Cultural Despair, and it's written oh, okay. about yeah, the politics of German um, philosophy between about 1880 and 1910, yeah, I know it, yeah. uh, where, where the 
philosophy was this cultural despair that they felt that Germany was becoming a, um, uh, that, that they were losing all of their um, uh, spirit and they were just doing these nasty making steel and making chemicals and, and ruining the countryside. And a lot of the young people accepted that. And, but those, the acceptance of this higher philosophical thing were better than just making steel caused a hell of a lot of young people to become Nazis. And that was the basis. So we have to watch that, too. Uh, Mr. Arnold, uh, I haven't gotten your book yet, but I intend to, uh, freezing in the dark, but I intend to get it and read it. Uh, you know, after you discussed, you know, showed us these maps of these foundations and who's funding what, you didn't really get into the motivation. What is the motivation of these foundations? Sure, I did. Know? Won't you listen to that last bit? The business well, about, about Maslow's okay. hierarchy. Is Pardon me. About Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, the last one, the not the needs itself, but what happens when you go up there? You begin to have very serious. Not everybody, but the people who particularly have the "I want to rule the world" syndrome to begin with. Uh, and, and that just sort of, that evolves in those lower needs. But if you get up into the higher needs and you get all of that, you find that you begin to mock the lower needs. You don't, you know, the old house is not good enough anymore, the, the old whatever is anymore. It's always those higher needs, and that's a, that's a common thing all the way up. But there are some people who are susceptible to this post-gratification forgetting. They actually have changes in memory ability. They block out the lower needs and do not recognize their importance. That's where the, a lot of the motivation comes from. And essentially what they're doing is they're taking a look at the lower needs and seeing how they, like industry and so on and jobs, and how they disturb the higher needs of beauty, of inspiration, and they fight against it they devalue it. Their values change. So the motivation is not exactly motivation. It's a pathology in part. Uh, so you, you know, there's a lot more to this than, there is, than I'm telling you here. I, 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 I actually talked to Abe Maslow once before he died, unfortunately, jogging. Uh, but the, the importance here is that don't worry about the motivation, they're doing it, and it doesn't matter why they do it, they're messing people up. So if you look for motivations, how you, if you, if you learn how to read people's minds that well, let me know, because I, I, I'm a newspaper columnist, I would really like to know that. Could, could I just one sentence? Uh, because you mentioned Germany, and I lot of, know, know quite a bit about that, uh, unemployment is important. Uh, Hitler was voted, voted in when Unemployment in various places reached over 20%. And many of the socialists became national socialists. Uh, I'm just saying, uh, it is it in the lower needs and having a job and feeling fairly secure in your society is very important. I just want to make a, a comment. It seems to me that I learned in the first grade that before I play a game, I need to know the rules of the game and how to keep score. And I think the left knows that very well. And they, they set the name of the game, they set the rules, and they know how to keep score, and they can change the rules whenever they want to. And in this issue, we're talking about climate change, they cannot lose. They win either way. They've already won. Look at how rich they are. And whether the science is right or wrong, what will happen when the science is right, they'll say, oh, made a mistake, I'm sorry. But they'll, go, they'll move on. They'll move on. So I think this uh, heartland should start thinking about not, this climate thing is the greatest hoax of my life, but I think there's going to be another one coming, and I'd be really interested in what the speakers have to say as to what's the next one they're going to change because this climate change is wearing thin. Okay, well, look, I created and managed the wise use movement that gave bloody noses to the, to the environmental movement as it was from about 1988 uh, till I got sick of it, and mostly because it became part of uh, the Bush administration's way of doing things. I figured, okay, I can quit putting on these ridiculously expensive and very difficult 
beat the heck out of your conferences like you're going to here. Try putting on one, one of these things yourself. Uh, they're not any fun, but they're wonderful for the people who go there. And that's why I did it until I didn't need it anymore. It's on automatic. It just, it's part of the culture. Part of the thing is I found out as a writer, and I've written eight or nine books, and uh, as a columnist, and I've written, um, you know, I'm a uh, weekly columnist of the Washington Examiner, uh, two different audiences, but the, uh, the real thing is you've got to attack them. And that's what I did in a movement. One of the things that I found is that you cannot, that industry can't do that job by themselves. There are laws against it because if they got together like the EGA is getting together, that's a violation of trade constraint, okay? They can't do it. So I went to them and said, give me the money and get the hell out of my way because I will go teach those bastards what it's like to fight, which I did. And I gave them bloody noses to the point that um, Don Young asked me to write a book called Undue Influence, and I told all of the dirty secrets because I have a lot of friends in Congress and staff and stuff like that, and they told me all of that. We were activists then. I was not doing that as a journalist. So I did that, and the deal was, okay, I get to pick the first panel, and I get to have a hearing on this book. Deal? And Young says, sure. He was chairman of the committee, so he could do that. All right. So I really beat the hell out of the Pew Charitable Trust, a uh, $4.5 billion endowment. And probably one of the most brilliant men runs their environment program. He's really a brain. I love uh, just talking to him because he's so smart. Uh, he's got an IQ somewhere up there in lights. Uh, and, uh, but he just doesn't, his, I don't agree with his politics or how he does it, but he knows how to do it. Uh, and it for some reason made him bleed. And I got letters from the, the head lawyer of Pew Charitable Trust that said, uh, what you said in this testimony is wrong, that Mr. Uh, we won't use his name here, but uh, he, he never really said that. Well, I said, what, uh, what are you talking about? I got that straight out of Mark Dowie's book, Lose, Losing Ground, five years ago. You know, it, it's not me you have the problem with, it's Mark Dowie. He's won the National Magazine Award twice, and that's pretty damn that's more than anybody else by, by one. Uh, so uh, if you get into the fray like that, you sometimes uh, stab them and make them bleed and you don't even know why. Uh, because this I just said, uh, you guys are orchestrating this and it, it had a, a particular list of things that they were doing. And uh, they said, he never said that. Okay, I said, well, until and unless uh, you get, you know, I get better, I stand by my story, screw you. Uh, and they didn't like that, but there wasn't anything they could do about it. I was absent malice, and so they couldn't, there was no legal action available. All right, so what happens about two weeks later, poor Mark Dowie, I mean, he, he's, he's, he's a, a nice guy, I don't like his politics, but he's a good guy. He ran Mother Jones for a while, that's really a tough thing to get and try and to get that thing off the ground. He, he was very good at it, and he, he turned it into a magazine so other people could take it over. I, I don't agree with the politics, but it sure tells you what the other side's doing, so I know who to beat up. See, you have to keep track of what's doing them so you can destroy them. And that's what you have to do. You have to destroy them. But at the same time, don't alienate your, your potential friends because your potential friends become real friends when you've got a campaign that's smart enough and wide enough and attractive enough, like that rapper. Think of all of the kids in Germany he's got thinking about things they couldn't think about before they heard his song. That's brilliant. Okay, so in other words, beat up the bad guys, but nurture the good guys. And the people who want a good environment, read the National Environmental Policy Act. It has two words in there that tell you everything. Con uh, productive harmony with nature. That's the law. And when do you ever see that? The productive just gets wiped out of it. Put it back, but attack them. Never let them get away with anything. Beat the crap out of them. Read my columns and you'll see what I'm talking about. I don't mince words. <laughs> I, dis I disagree a lot. I want conciliation and I want people to make friends and I want people to try to understand each other within limits. And that, but in the end, if mankind is to survive in a fairly harmonious state where you can make decisions. And we are very worried in Europe that the Americans can't make any decisions because they're so divided and 
what, what, what do you do? You, you beat the crap out of them or something like that. I hope you don't use guns. But, uh, you know, we are worried in Europe about the inability of the, of the American government to work because they dislike each other so much. And so I think you need, every so often, not all the time, there's a time for everything, you need people to make coalitions, uh, believe in coalition politics, uh, and, and, and to understand each other and then negotiate the middle way rather than beating the crap out of each other. I uh, think. Okay, <laughs> this, uh, there, that's absolutely true. That's diplomacy. Yeah. It's customary to have the war first. Yeah, okay. Get it? <laughs> I th it seems to me that the, the climate thing is, is, a, is, a, is part of something very much larger, a larger issue, which is that the public, we, we, we elected a disengaged president. We have a disengaged media. We have an uninformed, uh, I live in an uninformed academic community. Uh, when, I, when I speak to groups, I find the least informed groups I ever speak to are university people because they're so disconnected from what's going on around them. And I think it's because they're insulated. Maybe it's tenure. I don't know what it all is. But, but, but we have so many scandals. We have, we, have, we have a media today that I think uh, is, first of all, very intentionally uninformed. Mm -hmm. I, and we're seeing it in every aspect of, of government. We're seeing it with, with all the prevalent scandals. It's, scandals are not a new thing in government, it's, but it's the first time they've been celebrated. And, and, and I think the climate thing we're seeing where people are so, so uninformed, so disconnected from what's going on. And when, Ron, when you were talking about Maslow, and I was, I was thinking uh, what I understood you to say was that in, in his pyramid of needs that people have, you know, subordinate their lower needs in order to achieve their higher needs. And, and it almost seems to me that the ones that have subordinated to lower needs are basically because they've already achieved them. I mean, I don't, I don't see many activists in the climate that are hurting economically or, or going without food or going without, you know, that are freezing in the winter and so on. Yeah, that the, was part of his theory. The, that they're, they're the ones. I didn't say it very well, but you need, you need, you, this is a very good point and when I'm sorry that I missed, that what he found out was that these needs did not evolve higher until the lower ones were gratified. Okay. And as they were gratified, then it was possible to go to the next one and so on, you get the idea. But yeah, that's a very good point. But we have such a, uh, and we, we talk about, you know, in America, and I think it's probably throughout the world now, we, we, we do so poorly in sciences and math and so on. We, we do great in social work, uh, but basically, Social work doesn't create a lot of new jobs. Uh, and, and I don't know what's going to change this. It seems to me that there's, there's really two things that can change it. Energy can become, and food, which is related to energy, can be, and everything else we have can become so expensive that it begins to hurt those who, who have satisfied their needs. And, and the, the other is maybe Mother Nature will, will, will intervene. As some people are predicting, we're, we, you know, with with the uh, solar cycles now and, and, and the low sunspot activity, which is reflecting of uh, magnetic activity in sun and so on, with the oceans flipping, as as, uh, as was mentioned last night. Maybe maybe that will have an impact, but how long does it take? How long does it take before people look out the window and, and realize that that these these things have, have not materialized. Um, can we wait long enough? Can we, un, can we unwind everything that EPA is doing? Can we unwind the executive orders? Um, the people I see, in, 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 in someone who I met at the conference said, why are, why are you guys so old? You know, the skeptics, why are we so old? And they said, because the young people need to keep their jobs. And it's not until you reach a point of some independence that you can speak out. And maybe that's part of the Maslow thing, where we, as maybe as we mature, we do seek the spiritual things. We start thinking about our grandchildren and, and our children in the future. Maybe we become more generous. Maybe we have the luxury of thinking about the future. If so, let's start dealing with it. Well, we've come to the end of our uh, allotted time. Thank you, uh, panelists, so much.
And I'd like to thank you for penetrating questions and analysis. Uh, and we have a good session. And if you want to continue the conversation, the victims are right up here in the podium.